All right, it's go time. We're live. Wait for the stream to catch up here. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I can't believe it's February already. <laughs> uh, and February is going to be gone before we before we know it here. Um, so welcome to uh, Merge PHP 2024. Um, we we have a shorter deck. If you haven't uh, seen a, a video from us in in a month or so, we've we've got a shorter deck here. So uh, we're going to do the intro here. Um, but basically, merge PHP. It you know it, it's just a bunch of user groups uh, coming together to put on virtual events. And so here's a list of user groups. I think we're up to ten now. Um, here's a bunch of logos of all the different user groups. Um, so there, you know, if you uh, see your user group here listed, give us a shout out um, from uh, the city that you reside in. Everyone's welcome to join us. You, you're not um, obligated to be a part of a user group. This is open to anyone and everyone. Um, so welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, and every month we give away a JetBrains license. So the first person to email uh, Chris at Atlanta PHP wins one year to any JetBrains product. Uh, so um, email Chris and help us help you. That, that is the official announcement. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so the obligatory uh, PHP support, and uh, thank you to Tim probably for keeping this updated. Um, as you see, today is February eighth, and that the the red line is up to date. So hopefully we are all on eight two or eight three, and and uh, eagerly waiting eight four later this year. Um, <laughs> And I just upgraded the project from 7.4, so I'm hoping people are up to date because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if I bless you if you're using WordPress, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, WordPress is usually the problem. Um, but you know that you know th there's always Docker, right? So uh, yeah. Um, so some upcoming conferences and events. Uh, February uh is got quite a bit here happening um and uh, march as well so um it's it's this is like basically q1 um well i, I guess a little into q2 there but uh definitely check out uh, php tech in april um they are a part of this you this merge php um and so we like supporting our fellow user groups um and uh, tickets are on sale, I'm sure. I'm not sure if we have a discount code this year, but um, you could probably wrangle you one um, if you need one. Um, but uh, yeah, um, lots of stuff happening. And this is just the first half of the year. Uh, so j definitely check us out on the socials. Um, but uh, please... Give us a like and subscribe here on YouTube. That helps us out a lot. Um, and also check, check us out on LinkedIn. And next month, we are going to be talking about XR Debug. Uh, so a really interesting talk, uh, open source tool uh, that I think will help us all debug our code um, that we have in dev and, and maybe production. Um, so check, check that out next month. All right. Um, oh, and uh, before here we get into it, um, if you are interested in speaking, uh, the link to submit a talk is uh, mphp.io slash speakers. We're always looking for new speakers. All right. Um, so jo I've got Josh up here um, on the panel, and he's going to be our presenter this evening. Um, so we are going to be talking about um, pipelines and uh, PHP and uh, uh, you know how to do DevOps right, um, particularly with GitHub Actions, 
Um, and uh, I guess you're, you're going to be talking about GitLab as well. Is that right, Josh? Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Um, it'll be interesting to see the comparison of the two uh, and what your thoughts there um, between them. I've I've heard uh, that uh, GitHub is a little bit of a wild, wild west. And I've used, it's been a couple of years since I used GitLab. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. So um, it sounds like you've got some, uh, a couple of practical examples, um, you know, to kind of tell us the differences there. Uh, so uh, looking forward to it. Um, and uh, yeah, let, let's, let's get started. Give us a minute here while we switch the, the screen over um, and get Josh's uh, presentation up. Yeah, give me one second here. Let me know if we can see the ocean. There we go. Cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> hello, PHP community. Thanks for watching, whether you're watching live or you're watching this later at the comfort of your own time. Appreciate you guys uh, and girls uh, for tuning in. So today we're going to be talking about writing the pipeline. Uh, before we dive into the talk, I do just want to give a couple of notes about uh, what Logan just mentioned about Merge PHP. Uh, so uh, our user group here in Las Vegas, we joined a couple of years ago, and we love, obviously, free knowledge and sharing with others, and this is what Merge PHP is all about. So Logan's point about looking for speakers, we're not just looking for expert-level speakers. If you're entry-level and you learn something cool, uh, we accept every everyone's ideas, uh, whether at whatever stage you are at in your development career. So definitely check us out at mergephp.com if you want to learn more about talks coming up and things like that. Uh, we meet on the second Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific time every month. So always uh, juicy new content coming out every month. So thanks to all of our past speakers and uh, some exciting ones coming up. So let's dive in. Ride the Pipeline. Uh, this talk was thrown together uh, for my local user group because we got some questions about uh, deploying uh, code via pipelines. And, you know, it can be a bit of a mystery uh, when you're just diving into pipelines in general, especially if you're doing things traditionally where you're just SSH into a box and pulling down code and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. A little bit about me, uh, I've been a programmer since 2006, I've been doing PHP since 2011, I think some, somewhere around there, actually probably earlier, uh, and I'm the CTO of Remote Dev Force, and I run a user group out here in Las Vegas, so if you're ever in Las Vegas, uh, add me on any of the socials, I'm at OG Programmer. This is me wearing the fancy new Apple Vision Pro. And uh, I'm preparing to return it next week. So that should speak a lot about where I feel, what I feel about that product. It's a great entertainment device, but I did not get the productivity boost that I thought I was going to get out of that. So I'm not good for programming. All right. Remote Dev Force, this is my company. We have over 12 developers across the U.S. And we do freelance development, whether it's PHP, Terraform, AWS DevOps stuff completed hundreds of projects, and you can scale from just one developer part-time all the way up to an entire team. So if you're interested, shout me out, josh at remotedevforce.com. So I've broken up this talk into three different sections. The first is why to use pipelines. The second, we'll talk a little bit about setting up your pipelines. And the third, we'll ride the wave and we will deploy a PHP app. Uh, so let's dive right in. <clears throat> So why why pipelines? Like I, I've met people who kind of, it's just them on a project, it's one person and, you know, they don't want to set up pipelines and that's completely fine. Like there's no uh, book that says this is the way you must uh, have a software development life cycle in SDLC, right? You can do whatever you want. And for solo person, that's probably fine. Uh, but I think we all realize that code is a team sport. Uh, in, in most cases, right? Aside from, you know, your pet project that you're trying to spin up in a bigger size company, 
you're going to be dealing with multiple developers on one code base. So when that occurs, then you don't want a bottleneck of only one person being able to deploy the code, especially deploying to something like a lower environment, like a release candidate environment or staging or something like that. So coding is a team sport, right? You're going to need to orchestrate, uh, you know, with other people in order to get your code out, uh, whether that's through merge requests and things like that. So. One of the biggest pushbacks that I've seen from people implementing pipelines is that they believe it's hard. And I think this goes back to just a lot of the, you know, you don't know something and you're hesitant because you're fearful that you might not do it right. And I can say that there's a lot of great things out there now for you to get up and running fairly quickly. I would say some baseline pieces of knowledge for you to be able to understand pipelines would be, do you know how to read output from a log? Meaning if an error happens, can you read a log and figure out you know, the error and maybe Google it and figure out what's going on, right? It's best to have some sort of basic bash scripting skills. Uh, this also goes along with knowing what YAML is because both GitLab GitHub, as well as Azure ADO, which I recently built some pipelines in, all use YAML. So it's a very simple scripting language. If you score the free JetBrains license that we're giving away, then auto, all of that stuff like formatting is out of the box. But if you're using like Notepad++, plus plus, uh, bless you. Yeah, you're going to have to worry about spacing and things like that, and it might not compile. So. But any modern IDE will support YAML. And uh, the last thing here is just SSH in general. I think just having a basic understanding of how to shell onto a server and, you know, running simple commands is, uh, you know, uh, good to know. Not necessarily required with uh, some of the modern GitHub actions that are out there right now. You really don't need to mess around with Bash or PowerShell. A lot of that stuff is abstracted away from you. But if you need to do something custom, it will help to know some basic batch scripting. So, yeah, one of the people here says uh, YAML is basically JSON for Python developers. <laughs> yes, I agree. Uh, so, by the way, if uh, somebody uh, does say something in the YouTube comments, I'm, I will get to that at the end. I don't have it up live at the moment. I just have my StreamYard chat open. But anyway... Googling, obviously, so that's nice. Yeah, always figuring out problems. That's like my life. Uh, damn you, Terraform, for always giving me errors that are not actually the errors, and I have to find out the hard way. Uh, so if you know those things, you can write a pipeline. Nowadays, we're spoiled as developers. I kind of joke with some of the you know, new people looking to get into programming about how easy it is to get up and running with uh, technologies. And, I mean, even when I started programming 10 years ago, uh, my CTO told me uh, back in the day it was Wild West. There was no standards. Nowadays, you guys are spoiled. There's standards, etc. So same. now we got ChatGPT. So you can see here is an example. I'm saying, hey, I've got a Symphony project. Can you give me a working prototype for a GitLab pipeline? And sure enough, it spit something out. As with everything ChatGPT, it got 90% of it right, and 10% was wrong that I had to figure out. So that's always a thing. I mean, even with Stack Overflow or Googling, it should never take some copy, uh, copy and paste examples at face value. You should understand what it's doing. That's what makes you a better developer is reading code and you know, getting underneath the hood on things and diving into libraries and such. So uh, I, I, I did that, and I'll show some examples of what that outputted and some of the changes I made to it. So a basic software development lifecycle looks like this. A developer goes and updates code on their local machine. They end up pushing a PR up to either GitLab, GitHub, or one of the other many places to push code. And they create a pull request. So at this point, the pull request may run things like tests, like we'll talk about here in a little bit. 
And once it's merged, another pipeline can kick off to actually go deploy things to uh, your lower environment. And uh, yeah, so that's that's your generic, you know, run-of-the-mill software development lifecycle, right? Most of us are familiar with. Traditional architecture, and what I mean by this is just like bare metal or NEC2, uh, so not serious. But your traditional architecture, basically, from that, uh, from that point when the code is merged, you typically have either a manual or an automated deployment. Sometimes people do things like night builds or deploy the hour or whatever strategy the team agrees on. But typically from there, the, the, uh, mind you, Docker uh, is running these containers for both GitLab as well as GitHub. Uh, is my audio choppy, Logan? Do, 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 I'm getting some feedback that it's choppy. It is going in and out. Um, uh, let me see. I can't can't hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. For okay. whatever reason, my Mac decided to switch to my iPhone. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it, yeah, that's strange. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, where did I cut off? Uh, like right back here, at the this front point. Yeah. Anyway, so you merge code. The code goes somewhere, and where that goes is basically a Docker container that's running your pipeline. So in either GitLab or GitHub, you'd have what's called runners. And those runners are essentially just servers or containers, something to run the build of your code. Uh, bet, bet most cases, it's a container. So you're defining an image, and uh, I'll be happy to provide some examples of images here in a minute. There are some good ones. In fact, I'll I'll drop it in uh, the slides here. I will share the slides in the um, YouTube comments if anyone's interested in pulling these up later. So the build runs. So you're doing composer install. You're doing whatever you need to to get all your dependencies in order, and then from there is actually deploying the application. So again, in this traditional environment, deploying to a server. So that container needs a way to get access to that server. We'll show one strategy here in a little bit on how to do that. Essentially, just go to the server, push a code. You may need to run some deployment steps, run migrations, things like that. All of that stuff, again, those bash skills come in handy at that point to add whatever custom bits you need into your pipelines to be able to do that. I apologize. This uh, this slide's a little messed up. I didn't have the animation set up right. But anyway, this is what a modern architecture looks like. So we're talking serverless, we're talking ECS, we're talking Kubernetes, all the fancy whiz bang tools that all the kids like to rage over nowadays. And essentially it's the same thing, except after your build process in the Docker container here, we are, instead of pushing to a server directly, we're going to take a snapshot of that image at that point in time. And that image is then going to get put into a container registry. You can store your images on Docker Hub. You can store your images on GitLab. There are a lot of different choices. You can use Amazon ECR, a ton of different places. But essentially, push my Docker image up somewhere that later on, when I go to deploy my app, it will pull that image down and run it. Some people pack their code into the container. Some people add a mounted volume. Some people copy the code over. Whatever works for you. Uh, don't put the code in there and put it into a public image. That's one, one thing is Docker Hub does have public images. You wouldn't want to put proprietary code in there and share that to the world. So just make sure you're kind of crossing your T's and dotting your I's on the security side of things. But this is what a modern deployment looks like. So I apologize. There is going to be a lot of screenshots going forward here.
but uh, uh, yeah, deal with it, I guess. So this is GitLab, and I just wanted to show one of the clients I work with, their kind of basic pipeline. They have nothing, nothing fancy. They just wanted something simple. So when a PR is created, they have two stages, one to install the version of PHP they're using, which we just got an A2. I'm pretty excited about that. Got to get to A3 though. And then uh, from there, once that image has PHP 8 on it, it runs all the tests. So these all kind of run in parallel here. So it doesn't have to like wait one by one as it goes down the list here. All of them kind of fire off at the same time and makes things a heck of a lot quicker. So as you can see, this pipeline takes like four minutes, which is not bad. At one point, this was taking like 15 minutes. I've even seen pipelines that take an hour to run, like for a full deployment. I mean, it's wild. Like, again, if you have a ton of tests and you're using a headless browser to do, you know, end-to-end -end testing and stuff like that, those sorts of tests just take a lot longer to run. It, there's no right or wrong answer here for like how long, but anytime you can parallelize something, if that's a word, do it. So same thing with tests, like breaking them out. If you have like a massive suite of tests, like creating groups that you can kind of run three or four of them at the same time are kind of simple ways to speed things up. In the GitHub world, this is basically what the GitHub Actions tab looks like, and this is their version of GitLab pipelines. So GitHub Actions are just like GitLab uh, pipelines in the sense that there's jobs, there's containers, all that good stuff. You can see here, I have all of my different actions here on the left. This is an open source project called Phobos that I made a couple of years ago. Uh, this project actually shows how to take a PHP application. I've got a Symfony application stuffed in here, but taking a PHP application and deploying it to AWS ECS with Terraform, GitHub Actions, and you know the, all that CI CD fancy business. So all of that stuff is in here. I've spent a lot of time getting all the instructions in order for this. So I hope, you know, if you are interested in a modern architecture, definitely take a look at this. I, I spent quite a bit of time putting this together and I feel like it hasn't gotten the love that it needs, but it's still a great, even if you don't end up using it, it may give you some ideas on what to do in your infrastructure. But there's a lot of great Terraform examples in here for uh, AWS, ECR, ECS, that sort of setup. ECS is a great stack. I, I love ECS. I think um, Kubernetes is great if you have a solid DevOps team that can support Kubernetes. But more often than not, in some of the teams I've worked with, nobody seems to understand Kubernetes and doesn't have the willing to learn, and I can't be the only one supporting it. So ECS has been our kind of go-to in, in most projects. But there's nothing wrong with Fargate, uh, EKS, and things like that. That's definitely great stuff, too. Just don't build massive lambdas. I've seen that done so many times. People build one application that's like 500 megabytes, and then they run into all kinds of lambda issues. Lambdas are meant to be small functions. Okay, get off my soapbox. So if you want, take a look, because in a, this is obviously an open source project, and you can go and take a look at the actions and, and how they work. And in the actual git.github folder here, is all of the workflows. So in here, you can see all of my different stages. So let's take a look at the plan, for example. We have two different triggers here. Either on a pull request, this will fire, or this workflow dispatch means that it's a manual deployment, like I can click a button and kick this off. And down here are our different jobs. So we define a working directory, and in here, we're defining the different jobs that we have. So pre-flight checks, we are running on Ubuntu container, so it's going to pull the latest Ubuntu container when it runs this. We check out the code. And then just a quick note, I think the reason Logan mentioned, you know, actions, uh, GitHub actions are kind of a wild, wild west. And I, I agree. And, and the reason that that's the case is because 
there are a ton of open source actions out there, okay? You don't need to just use official actions that GitHub provides. All of the official actions that GitHub's prov GitHub provides are in a project called Actions under the GitHub organization. So things like this checkout is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to check something out. I'll dive into some other details like tagging and stuff like that here in a bit. But I just want to zip through this just to kind of give you an understanding of some of the features here. So with any of the jobs, and this goes with GitLab too, you can have conditions. So in here, you can see I say, if I'm on the develop branch, let's do this. Let's set the environment to staging. If we're on the production branch, aka main, we will set the environment as production. And that just echoes out into this GitHub env that gets kind of spewed out into the rest of these jobs here below. Here, I'm just configuring AWS credentials. So I'm, I store secrets with the IAM keys. There are very cool modern ways of doing this where you use OpenID Connect, which is a, an OID, uh, OIDC, and you don't even need to mess with keys. You basically just say, hey, AWS account, you have access to this repository. And the repository can just uh you know assume a role and do what it needs with the role that you've given it to do those actions so you don't need keys you can do that there are some security implications on both sides of these things open id is not a silver bullet too there's been some more recent hacks that have happened that have involved open id and some flaws so uh at the end of the day a secret's got to live somewhere so I'm always getting arguments with some architect, uh, you know, inf infrastructure people that they're like, you know, no, no secrets, no nothing. At some point, you've got to have secrets somewhere. So anyway, off my soapbox again. We're setting up Terraform. So HashiCorp has a bunch of, you know, different actions. And in here, you can see I'm just running some bash. I'm just saying, hey, run format. Make sure the Terraform isn't all jacked up and the syntax looks right. Run the make command. And this make command has all of the things I need to run my Terraform init and do a validate, make sure the Terraform uh, you know, init looks good after the fact. Then I have a new job for the actual Terraform plan. Same kind of bits here. The only real difference is I run make TF plan. And down here at the bottom are all the status outputs. So at the very end, I like to spit out kind of a summary of what happened during this pipeline run. You don't have to do this, but this is nice for debugging things later on. So in here, you can track whether things failed or not, and it will output whether it failed and it'll give cool little like check marks and stuff in the output and look really neat. And you can even have it drop a comment on the PR and with that output. So that's kind of how like, you know, you look, you look at some open source projects and you can see some bots that are running out there doing stuff. That's all being done mainly through GitHub Actions. And it's fairly easy to set that stuff up. You just kind of need to dig around and, and you know, look at doc, docs and things like that. And this was the job results thing I'm talking about at the end. What did everything do? And I just kind of store this uh, variable throughout and just capture the different outputs of what happened. And, and that's that. So again, take a look at that repo if you want to learn more about doing ECS with AWS and all that good stuff. <clears throat> all right. I'm looking at time. We're good. Okay. So moving right along here. We spoke a little bit about triggers, the different kind of triggers, and there's many of them. This is just kind of scratching the surface of the big ones, but on push of a branch, so if I push up a, a new branch or I push code to an existing branch, you can trigger a pipeline job based off of that. Same with a pull request, a pull request gets created. You can do it on different things too, like pull request close, pull request update, things like that. Or you can do manual launch. I prefer manual launch for production because I never trusted it automatically just pushing stuff to production without the team knowing that stuff's going live. But if you have a really good test suite and you trust your developers, go for it. 
automate your production pipeline to automatically kick off when main gets merged in. Just make sure you're tagging stuff. That way you can easily roll back, which my pipelines do support a rollback. If you're interested in learning how to do a rollback, that, that stuff's in there. I don't think we're gonna have time to jump into that, but. So we showed a little bit of those YAML examples there. And I'm just giving you a contrast here of what GitHub versus GitLab looks like. So with GitHub, we're using the on keyword here, saying on pull request. And this colon here, you can just define more configurations, like I mentioned, like on specific branches or whatever. And same thing with GitLab, instead of the on, you're using the workflow keyword. And in there, you're going to define rules of when the workflow kicks off. So for example, this says the pipeline source equals merge request event. So a merge request was created. It's a little bit more verbose. GitLab tends to be. Uh, and going back to the whole GitHub versus GitLab, GitLab, you know, you the tools are there. Everything, uh, the docs are great. Uh, but you are kind of like in uh, GitLab's territory when it comes to the syntax and things like that. GitHub Actions, I feel like came a little later and kind of learned some of the whole like keep it simple principles. And personally reading GitHub Actions, it's a little easier for me to kind of understand out the gate, but there's GitLab is too. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with GitLab's syntax as well. So uh, here is an example of how to run a test with GitLab. So as I mentioned, you know, something super simple. We're going to have one stage here. Stages are essentially different uh, environments if you want to run, uh, let's say, a node build in one and a PHP build in another. You can use stages to kind of separate that stuff out. Image and the image here just defines the image that you're using. I apologize, I'm using an outdated version in this example, but you get the point. I'm using the official Docker Hub PHP image and I'm using whatever version I define here. And then in this script, this is again going back to the bash skills. All you need to do is just tack on whatever you need to run uh, that you would typically run in bash. And if we wanted to do PowerShell, we would run a Windows image instead, and then we'd have the equivalent of those bash uh, commands in PowerShell instead. So just have to take that into consideration if you do have a Windows environment. So here we have a GitHub action that does the same thing. It's, it's a little bit longer, but it's more concise from from just reading it, you can see on push, on pull request, very simple. And then what we run on, so Ubuntu latest. And then we've got our steps below that breaks down the different steps involved. So installing dependencies and then running the actual PHP unit test down here at the bottom via just the vendor bin PHP unit. You can pass whatever flags or whatever you want there, but Again, all of your GitHub actions are gonna be stored in the .github folder in your project at the root. Same thing with the uh, uh, GitLab. It's a .gitlab-ci YAML file that's typically also stored at the root level. So hidden folders, hidden file, whatever. But that's where you're gonna have all of your definitions for your pipelines. So let's dive into some deployment examples. This one is using GitLab. So we've got two stages here. We've got a build stage. We're gonna build our project. And then a deploy stage. We're gonna actually deploy what we built. In here, you see we've got a couple of variables that we need. Some of these variables uh, need to be either, you can hard code them in here, but one of them that you don't want to hard code is your SSH private key. So in this example, we are going to deploy to a traditional EC2, right? Just a quote unquote bare metal server. It's not bare metal, it's virtual, whatever. It's the server, right? And we can get to it. So we are going to store 
in our secrets, our private SSH key. And when we run this pipeline, those keys automatically get injected in here. And that uh, this environment variable now has our secret. If you try to echo it during the run, GitLab as well as GitHub is smart enough to know that, hey, this person locked this as a secret. I'm not going to output it. So you'll see a bunch of asterisks instead of actually spitting out the secret value. Mind you, there's probably clever little ways to get around it, but we're not, this is not a security talk. So there are probably better ways to get to the server other than SSH private key, but I'm just trying to keep things simple with this example here to keep, uh, keep things concise. So we are going to first get our SSH uh, house in order. So we're going to install the open SSH client. We're going to run the SSH agent, and then we're going to inject our SSH private key into the agent via the SSH add command. From there, we then, excuse me, start to set up the .ssh directory to tell the local server that we know this host. So if you've ever SSH to a brand new box or recently GitHub actually changed their keys, it'll say, hey, yes or no, do you trust this fingerprint? So it's kind of like an SSH fingerprint from the server saying like, do you actually know who you're connecting to? It avoids middleman things and things like that. If you want to gut check that fingerprint to make sure you're not getting man in the middle. But anyway, in this case, we are basically saying, yes, we know who this is by taking the IP address of this. We're running key scan on that IP, and then we're injecting the fingerprint into this known host uh, file here. That avoids the need for SSH to go, whoa, you're trying to connect to something you've never connected to. Are you sure? Now that we've done this step, it won't say that. And then we just got to chmod it because otherwise it won't respect the file. Later on in this pipeline, after we've got our SSH stuff in order, now we're getting into the nitty gritty of PHP. So Composer, all the beautiful people who've built Composer, that was definitely the thing that brought PHP back to life. So shout out to all of everybody involved in that project. And then you see we do some symphony commands here, like we're clearing cache, we do a cache warm up, whatever you need to build your project. You may have other commands here, but this is the build stage. So anything we need to do to prep stuff, this is what we're going to do. One thing I want to mention that can make pipelines take a long time is when you're not caching certain things. So for example, Everybody knows one of the biggest directories in your project is typically your vendor folder because it just has the whole world in there of all these open source projects, right? You want to cache that and make sure that you have like a good key based off of that. I think an example later here, I'll show it, but basically take the, you know, the, the hash of the composer lock file and if that changes, then we bust cache. So doing things like that, where you can still make sure that the next time it runs, it is pulling down the latest vendor uh, dependencies. But in here, so we're just defining a bunch of stuff that we know we want to uh, store in artifacts. And then we just give it an expiration time here. I'll, I think later I have some other examples about caching we'll get into. But anyway. The very last bit here, we SCP all of the code over. So we take everything that we've built and then we move it into the deploy path on the server. Again, there are probably better ways to do this. You can zip it up, you can move that over, you can just go straight to the server and maybe use a deploy key. Uh, Get, GitHub does have a uh, pretty cool feature where you can set up a deploy key in fact, let me see if I can show you that real quick, because that, that was neat. I just figured that one out um, a couple months ago. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, deploy keys. So typically, I would go and onto a server, and I would set up a key pair, and then I would like you know set up like a bot account or something on the actual org, 
that would be in charge of pulling the code down from the server. But here, you can just put the key, your uh, key here. And then from there, this key is then respected by the repository. So you don't need a user on your org with a key attached to do this. You can just drop a key here. Anyway, that, that was a neat feature. So in this case, uh, you know, we can kind of go to the server, run a get pull, and then, you know, run the build there on the server if we really wanted to. So different ways to do it, but yeah. So from here, we uh, after we've got the code onto the server, we're going to jump onto the server and then run our migrations, basically run whatever you need to do your final bits of orchestration to get the app up and running. So that's about it for GitLab in a simple example. Now we'll show the same example in the GitHub Actions flavor. So here we've got our name of our uh, job, our action. And you can see we've got the on trigger. Same deal here. On the push of the master branch, or main, or whatever you call it. Workflow dispatch, again, that's a manual trigger. So how that works is here in the actions, I can click on an action and I this run workflow button is what gets enabled when this workflow dispatch is turned on. So if it's on, then you can go to the action and run it manually, which is nice. So again, for actually doing the final production deployment, that's typically what I use. And you can you can do things too, like only owners or certain roles can launch that. That way you can kind of lock down a particular uh, GitHub action. So not everybody can run a production release or whatever. So there's still some safety guards you can set up there. And then here, again, same deal, but GitHub, GitHub flavor. We're checking out the code, pulling the code down. Then this right here just sets up PHP on the Ubuntu container. This is an open source project. And just to speak a little bit about tagging, the most secure way to do tagging is to use a GitHub, uh, to use a get hash. So if you actually go to one of these actions here and you go and find out, okay, what, you know, V1 or whatever it is, basically just find the commit hash of it so example here, copy the hash, and you can stick that hash here at the end, and it will pull down that particular thing. Now, the reason that that's the most secure is because tags can get overridden. So this, you know, in theory, a bad actor could taint one of the old tags and put some bad stuff in there, and then now we're pulling that stuff down. So if you want to be super secure, you're like NORAD level stuff, you may want to, well, they probably have mirrors and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, set up PHP, outdated version, wonderful. I need to update these slides. Install dependencies. Here we're going to do the same steps, right? Bash, composer install, get the cache cleared and run a warm up. Then from there, we tar up all of the, the app so in here, you can see I'm zipping it all up. And it's it's mainly just the artifacts that we're zipping up here because that's what we're storing into the GitHub Actions cache. So here you can see this step, upload artifact. We've taken all of our cache directories, such as the vendor folder and whatever else we want to cache. And that's what we're pushing up to the GitHub cache. Then the next time this runs, you, it will pull that down and Composer install will just fly on through because all of the dependencies are already there. Now we're into our deploy step here. And in here we have a condition. We say, if we are on the main, AKA master, your production branch, then it will allow the rest of this to run. So you can tweak that however you want. But in here, same deal. We're downloading the artifacts, so that way it saves us time for, for any sort of build steps we've already done. Now we've got our build cache here, and this is using an official GitHub action. And then down here, we've got some open source action that I found that does an SSH deploy. 
So we just, with, with any GitHub actions that you use that are open source, take a look at their docs because they will have a bunch of input values that you can provide to it. Just like Terraform and a resource has a variable and there's typically a ton of different inputs on, you know, things that you may copy an example and you're like, hey, I wonder if it does this. Go take a look at the docs because there's probably some other input values you can put in here to do, do what you want. Or, hey, even go to the GitHub action and it's all open source. If something doesn't work quite the way you want it, the beauty with open source, you can go to this action, put the feature in that you want and give it back to the world, right? So in here, we have to provide the private key. So that's where we're storing that private key secret. I'll show where that is in a little bit. We take the zip file of what we want to deploy and where we're going to deploy it, the remote user, so EC2 dash, you know, user or whatever it is. And then the deploy path of where we actually want to expand this tar file. So you can see here, these are the arguments it's going to use when it expands all the code. And then boom, now the your new deployment is now sitting on your traditional server. And then the last step is just running our build commands. So we uh, SSH onto it, and then you can run whatever you need. I think this got cut off, but yeah. All right, so I wanted to just display some more, you know, I would say complex and also to, uh, highlight some of the statuses you could see in, uh, this is GitLab we're looking at now. So in here, we can see that we could run a pipeline manually, just like we did with the GitHub Actions. Here's where you can do that. You can see all the statuses of different things running. So here we have something that's in flight right now. It's looks like it's at the tail end of it. If we wanted to cancel this, we could just click on this X here. If we want to replace something that failed, we can click this play button to replay it. Or let's say something failed and we're like, hey, why did this fail? The output logs don't look clear. You can click on one of these here and see the output logs of what happened. But let's say something's not clear. You can download the artifacts that you've saved and take a look at the files themselves to maybe do some further debugging as to why something didn't work. Here we can see this is a failed status. And then when you see pass with an exclamation point, that just means that there's warnings that were echoed out during one of the things. So for example, somebody maybe added some more code but didn't add code coverage on it. And now code coverage is saying, hey, you know, we're a little over the limit, whatever it is. That's just throwing a warning out there. And if you've got green skies and everything's great, this is your past. So that's what that will look like. And you can always go see the history of things by going back into finished or what's running currently or what's pending, meaning it's waiting for runner to become available to actually run the pipeline. This is a little more on the lines of what I was talking about with your different stages and doing the deployment side of things. This is your, I would say, holy grail of a simple software de development lifecycle. You've got your build, you've got a few tests that you run on the build, and then it automatically deploys to a lower environment, your stage, your RC, your QA, whatever you want to call it. Somebody will go gut check it. Yep, looks great. Then the last step, manually deploy production. So this, this I, I believe, is my kind of favorite as far as a pipeline is concerned. So just to dive into more details on like how we would set up a traditional server to actually connect to our runner, I wanted to dive into some of these details because somebody at my local user group didn't have the bash or SSH experience. And I wanted to include those bits in here to teach some of you who may not have had that uh, experience on doing this sort of stuff. So we might get into some things that some of the veterans already know here, but 
bear with me. First, we're going to set up the server. That includes creating SSH keys, installing those SSH keys on the server. And then the actual pipeline YAML you'll need to set up to uh, start a simple like test and deploy and things like that. And you can expand that example to your needs from there. So if you probably have already done, if you're a developer anywhere, you've probably had this command of some sorts ran, SSH key gen. Um, perhaps if you have the RSA flavor or whatever, it doesn't really matter. This new ED25519 seems to be the new rage, even though Azure ADO doesn't support it yet. Yeah, that's what I ran here in this example. And then you just throw in some contact information. So dash capital C and then an email. That is helpful. By the way, try not to run great keys without that because later on when somebody's like looking at a bunch of public keys installed on a server, it's very easy for me to know whose key that belongs to. In fact, I just accidentally disabled some keys the other day that did not have that and they were locked out. So once we create the key, we can then echo out the actual private key just using cat. So like, give me the actual key, just spit it out, right? Echo it out. We're gonna copy that value and we're gonna put that into our secrets within the repository. So I'll show you here where the secrets are stored in a minute. And then after we have our secret installed, then we're gonna take our public key and we're gonna copy that and put that onto the server. So we're going to SSH to the server with whatever root key that we've originally installed. This right here is the deployment key that we're setting up. And we're going to put that deployment public key into the authorized key file, which then allows that key to connect to the server. This is what it looks like when you run that command. Uh, I still, to this day, don't know what this random art stuff is for. Uh, please, someone be in the chat, tell me what that's for, because I just now thought about that, and I still to this day have not looked into why random art is generated. <laughs> Somebody should make that into an NFT. Right. So then once we got the, uh, we're, we're going to take the private key here and never share your private key. It's called private key for a reason. I've got mine uh, clipped out here, but... I didn't actually end up putting this anywhere, so feel free to copy it. I don't care. But anyway, this is what a private key looks like. So you're going to echo that out, take that private key, and then that's what we're going to put into our secrets in GitHub. So you do want to first remove, at least in my experience with installing this, maybe leaving it there is fine, but take the begin and the end part off. So only copy this body here of the actual key. Because uh, I think when I had that on there, it did not work. But maybe I was doing something wrong there. But anyway, just take the key part and copy that value. Now, in GitLab, where you're going to put your secret is first go into Settings and then click on CICD. And there, you're going to find something called Variables. So you'll dive into there. And that's where you're going to be able to click Add New Variable. And this little window pops up that allows you to add a new variable. In here, you can see a couple of different flags. So we can protect this variable from running on certain branches. We can mask this variable, which is very important for this value because this is a private key, right? So we're only, we don't want this being spit out into the logs because somebody could copy that and uh, do bad things. And uh, yeah, some other flags here. We put a simple description of what this is. And then here is basically what your key is going to be for the actual variable, in, uh, your, your variable definition in your GitHub action. So we saw earlier, I had a variable defined called SSH private key. In here, we're giving it the same value. That way it gets injected and overwritten properly into our Git. Get, uh, GitLab pipeline, and we just paste the key in here. So, uh, so it looks like we got somebody that sets why the random art's useful. I will read that at the end, I promise. <laughs> I 
I'm glad somebody did. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm curious to learn why that's even there. Okay. So, boom. We got, we got a secret, buddy. I've got a secret and I ain't telling nobody. And in here, we've got, you know, this is where all of your, if you need to put any sort of variables, maybe you need to do something for prod or you need to do something for RC that needs to be a little different. This is where you can do stuff in here uh, for that kind of stuff. So we're keeping it simple. We just got one, one secret here. So that was GitLab. Now let's take a look at GitHub. So in GitHub, you're going to click settings, the top in your, in your repo. And then down on the left, you're going to see something for the um, action secrets. Let me actually, because I don't think it just, does it just say action? Oh yeah, secrets and variables. So right here, secrets and variables, and then actions. And then your this is this is your secrets tab, and then your variables tab. So in here, you can plop in all of that. Anything that's not a secret can just be thrown in variables. You can have certain environment ones, repository ones, or even organization level variables. So you can kind of that's kind of cool. You can kind of you know things for your whole org and all the repos you can define here. Thing at the uh, repository level could go here. And then things like my RC needs this or my prod needs that can go at this level. So that's kind of neat. Anyway, so we're creating a secret. Same deal. We don't need to say flag or anything like that because we, we've clicked the secrets tab and it knows, okay, this is, this is a secret going in here. So for example, you can see these two secrets I stuffed into my Phobos project that I put a IAM key and the secret here, and that's what I'm using to run Terraform against my AWS environment. So that's how you store a secret. Now let's test it and let's deploy it. So let's run this baby. So in uh, the, the, I just wanted to kind of show some output here. For example, when somebody creates a pull request, this is a job that kicked off and then I just clicked into it <clears throat> and you can see some, some examples here on what it did. So one thing I wanted to point out, you know, first it's grabbing whatever you define as your Docker image you want to use for your uh, GitLab or GitHub runner. I really like this stay alive PHP project. Definitely go check it out. This stay alive PHP image is kept pretty well up to date. I, in fact, kind of prefer it over the standard PHP. Oh, I, I believe they inherit the official PHP image anyway, but it just has a lot of your PHP tools out of the box that kind of come with it. I tried using the standard PHP image and adding all of my bits and creating a custom image, and it was just a lot of overhead for what, what I was trying to achieve here was just super simple. So I just ended up using that open source uh, Docker image and it did everything great and they set it up right. There, there's something quirky and you know sometimes you can run into this where your image takes forever to run. That can tend to happen if you're doing things like mounting volumes and there's a lot of like copy paste happening between it. So you just gotta be careful. So try to steer towards maybe using some open source image versus rolling your own, but they're rolling your own is fine. It's just, you may run into weird things like, oh, this is taking forever. Oh, we're using x86 or 64. Let's use ARM. And then you go to use Alpine Linux. And then you're like, great. Now installing anything requires four paragraphs of commands in order to get this to work. And then we got to do all these weird hacks to get it to work. It can be a pain in the butt. So anyway, learn from me. That stay alive one's pretty sweet. Uh, let me zoom out. What happened? Okay. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, we initialize a project. And then in here, we're pulling down the cache. This is what I wanted to show you guys and girls. Uh, so in here, but when this thing's running, it's going, hey, the last time you ran this, we cached all the composer dependencies. We cached all the yarn, NPM, node modules. Let's pull those back down and just expand those because your package lock file 
hash has not changed. You haven't done anything. And your composer lock file hash has not changed. So nothing has changed in those dependencies. Let's pull those down. Again, that is going to make your pipeline super duper fast because that's typically what your bottleneck is in the pipelines is having to do a whole bunch of big build stuff, pulling down, pulling down open source repos and getting throttled and all that jazz. So uh, this is the man, I, I already talked about this, but manual ways you can run a job again through that workflow dispatch. So if you go into your action, click on an action, this is where you can dispatch it manually and you can pick a particular branch. So for the case of this, this is what we will want for this example in doing a deployment. And yeah, so I guess, uh, we're going to have some extra time here because I'm already at the end of my slides. But uh, yeah, these are some cool resources I recommend checking out. The first one has like a Laravel example with using keys, uh, AWS keys, and, and uh, setting up a GitHub action. There's another one here that AWS has that ha uh, shows how to do ECS with a PHP simple application. And then there's Phobos that I created. That's like a full on end to end kind of CICD thing you can follow. Uh, feel free to rip that off. And, you know, I don't care. Licensing is not a big deal to me. Just if you do make something cool, feel free to push it back into the repo. But yeah, so uh, I think that is it. So thank you everybody for uh, attending this talk. I appreciate you all. So let me get to some of the questions. Let me pull up the YouTube real quick. Um, I've got a couple here as we wait. Yeah. Um, so sometimes yeah, they, they yeah. roll, roll in. Um, uh, thank you so much for your talk, Josh, by the way. Thank you for speaking. Um, uh, I, I learned a few things there about uh, GitLab and GitHub. Um, so I noticed on your uh, GitLab examples, I wasn't sure. I know GitLab gets expensive pretty quick. Do you know or do you remember if you use like a paid edition? Like if like the little circles with the green checks or whatever, is that like in the free version or in like a paid version? Yeah, so GitLab is pretty stingy on minutes, which is basically how they're charging for their their runners, right? So they have. I'm gonna be 100 with you folks. GitLab has like probably in the last year made a ton of changes as far as how they're billing, and one of the big ones was their their runners because i think a lot of people were using the free minutes and stuff like that which i believe you still get some little bits of, of free runtime but for your typical project you're going to eat through those fairly quickly so there are team plans that come with like x amount of minutes per month right if you run out of minutes that's where it gets expensive because then you need to start buying chunks of minutes on top of that which i've had to do in the past and it's been frustrating one of the things you can do that i've looked at and how to just completely dodge the whole gitlab runner situation is by creating your own runner so on aws or wherever you're hosting stuff you could create an ec2 running docker and set up the runner to actually communicate with your repository. That way, you're not spending minutes on their runners anymore. You're running all your stuff on your own infrastructure. Obviously, you're going to have to pay to run the EC2, right? So you kind of have to weigh, like, am I spending $30 here or $100 there, right? So there's got to be some sort of thought into that. But uh, it, it has been a little frustrating with, with the way that they've tiered it because it's all based on the amount of users to... Um, and there, there's just some confusing thing. I wouldn't be surprised in the next like six months, GitLab changes their, their billing again, because, mm. uh, some of the things make me scratch, scratch my head a little bit. Like they, if, if GitLab's listening, charge per user, don't do like a five and then like a 20. I think that's where things were kind of weird. It's like, just 
charge per user rather than having like these tiered plans, right? So mm. anyway. Yeah, I, I last time I looked at it, like their ultimate edition was like a hundred dollars per user or something. I, I think I, they might it might have changed since. That's then. That's wild. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. Lot. But hey, I mean, I'm sure some people are paying it. But yeah, I mean, they had uh, some uh, features like the DAST and SAST were built in. I think so. You know, if you're paying, you know. 20 or to 40 grand for your your dast um maybe you know it, it might be justified a little bit um but uh yeah um it depends on the size of the organization um i i when we were using gitlab um i was using the open source gitlab it was pretty easy to get it set up and running on um amazon uh, EC2, and then the our the runner I had going was actually just on my home lab server, like here in the office, um, and I and I had it the Linux runner and then a Docker runner, a couple Docker runners going as well, um, and it was it was nice to work with, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't have our pipelines were pretty simple. Uh, like even more more simple than your examples. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah. So may, maybe there, there's something that does frustrate me about about the GetLab uh, pricing, but I'm trying to remember what it is now. But yeah, so it looks like they're charging 29 per month. But the the caveat is you get 10,000 compute minutes. Like that's I think that's just flat. So. Mm. Uh, Again, if, if you're, what's cool about GetLab, I will say is you can run your own GetLab instance. You can't, from my understanding, run your own GitHub instance, right? Like, so if you are super paranoid about like putting your code anywhere, that is one of the coolest things about GetLab that I've seen the most heavily used part of GetLab is the fact that I can wall off my code from everything, right? Like I can host it internally. So yeah, that, that's definitely pretty sweet. And then on, on the GitHub uh, pricing side of things, you can see here, they kind of give you a set amount per month for free. Or, and then or, based on like the plan that you have, they give you so many minutes here as well. We, we're still on the slides. Oh, shoot. You're Sorry. on a different uh, screen. Uh, I must have shared a window. Uh, anyway, yeah. you yep. can go and look it up. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you just have to, if you're running pipelines all day long, go build your own runner. That's bottom line. Like, it's just going to be the cheaper way to, to do this stuff. Okay. Um, uh, do you have, you, you got any more for me, Logan? I, I think I'm going to read through the chat here, if not. Uh, yeah, let's get to chat here. Go, okay. go ahead. So uh, let's see here. Um Randy Hayes says CPHP rules. Uh, shout out, Mr. Bond. I think he would agree with you. Shout out from Boston PHP. I love it. Uh, let's see here. Rage against a PHP machine. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, I really like GitHub Actions. It was a pipeline that finally made sense to me. Yeah. I agree. Like I said, uh, GitHub Actions came after GitLab, I believe. So they probably learned a lot from GitLab and different ways. Obviously, with the nature of GitHub, it just was something that they really set up right with the fact that it's very easy to pull in open source actions. There's a lot of great documentation out there. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try something. What's that? Oh, look at that. Highlights the message. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, uh, or can you see that on the stream? Let me see. Uh, da, da, da. The link you just posted? No, like in the stream, like if you click on a comment or whatever, then it, it brings up like a little message. Uh, we we're I don't know how this thing works, so we're we're figuring this out on the fly. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, 
it's so, like debug it live. I love it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So if you if you just see 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 one uh, you want to highlight there, I think the last comment at the end uh, worth worth. Uh, yeah, I see that one. Yeah. Oh, hey Stefano. So Stefano is a good buddy of mine. He he works with me. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alias says, "Were you talking about Identicons earlier? The randomized icons that they have for profile pictures. Apparently, those are to prevent account spoofing in some situations, as they are unique to IP." Um, that, I that believe go- that was the the SSH. Yeah, uh, that's what they were referring to. Pattern, yeah. Yeah, that's a <laughs> random art. Okay, so so that so what they're saying is is based on the unique IP of where you're running that, that would be different art. Okay, I'm I'm still confused. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, there's another, uh, Logan, you posted something here. So yeah, I have a, uh, mar- some markdown that I, from chat bro that I, okay. Kind of goes over the answer. Visual uniqueness. The pattern is generated based on the public keys, cryptographic hash because the hash is unique for each key. The resulting pattern is also unique. This makes sense. This makes it easier for humans to recognize, and remember, the key's visual fingerprint compared to a long string. Okay. Uh, Easy verification. When you connect to an SSH server, the client can display the server's public keys random art. Okay. That, that makes more sense to me. So I guess if you're like super paranoid about your keys and once you connect to a server, you could output this visual art. In my case, it mine almost looks like a head, like a robot guy. It looks like one of those Tesla robots, like with a, (laughs) But yeah, the, this um, here would be an easy way for you to see, I guess, if you're getting man in the middle or something. Yeah, that, that's cool. I don't know if I still ever use that, but um, yeah, so cool. I think anybody have any other questions here before we wrap up? We've used GitHub and GitLab in the past, but never Actions or CICD. So it's really just that easy to get into. I don't need the cloud. Um, I'm trying to figure out what you mean by don't need the cloud. Um, Maybe for the runners? Right. Okay. Uh, Yes. So like you typically out of the box, what's great about an open source project on GitHub is they give you a ton of minutes for free. So like, that Phobos example I was showing you, I never hit a cap with like running that. But if you have a private project, I think that's where they get a little bit more stingy about the the minutes there. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't need to go build, again, for the sake of trying to keep things simple, use those runners. They're there for, re- especially since you can just say, hey, go use this Docker image. You don't have to be at the whim of whatever they provide you. Uh, that that kind of opens it up, at least on the GitLab side. I haven't really tried on the GitHub side using like a custom image um, outside of GitHub's purview, but I imagine it's possible somehow. Bobby says, if you're using a runner or EC2, for example, that's basically cloud. If you point to your own runner, then you can probably avoid the cloud. Okay. All right. Um. Cool. I I think uh, I think that sounds like all the questions that we have here. Uh, it's, again, I will post the. Uh, I, why don't I see comments turned on on the show? Oh, maybe I can't. Okay, I probably have to wait till the the video is published on the YouTube. But once the video is published on the YouTube, I will drop the slides. In fact, let me just drop the slides in the chat here right now. If anybody wants to take a look, feel free. Um, let me make sure I have, yeah, viewer suite. It, there's a, do you see the private chat there, and then the comments are above that? You should be able to talk in the comments. Yeah, I just posted it in the YouTube chat just okay, now. Okay. Oh, does this comment, I, I, again, yeah. sorry, folks, we're learning on the fly here, but <laughs> okay, you're right. So this, there's, 
we're using StreamYard, and I'm a little bit of a noob here. But yeah, there's a comments tab, and then I can join the chat from here. So I, I learned that. Next time I do a talk, I'll, I'll use that. <laughs> Sweet. So yeah, I shared the slides there. Again, take a look at the slides. Uh, take a look at the Phobos project I built. Take a look at those uh, resources that I posted. Those are great resources. And and just you know, playing around with your own projects. This is a, a you know, the here here's the thing. And I'll I'll, I'll shut up. The the thing that gets me is when people put so much time into manually either running tests or deployment, that takes a lot of time and not thinking ahead, like, you know, some people don't putting a little bit of time to set up the pipeline saves you a whole bunch of time later on down the road. Right. So, and it gives you an opportunity to learn something new. So definitely if you're not using pipelines, uh, you know, start with tests, build one that just runs tests for PR and then you get that working and then you slowly add, okay, now let's deploy with it and things like that. So it, it definitely helped me to figure out how to do it manually first before you automate it, you know, um, and instead of like diving straight into automation, um, was that the same for you as well? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, when I was building the whole Phobos project, all of it was running it manually in the beginning. Not until later did I do the fancy bits with like the pull requests. So uh, in here, just to kind of show an example, like see these like cool little checkboxes and stuff like all this stuff I added later. In the beginning, I just like, okay, run the test and then I built on top of it. And then, and so like things like fancy, like adding a comment in the pipeline, I, I just like stumbled onto an article, realized how easy it was and just copied and pasted that over and it just worked. So yeah, um, it's something just like with any project, don't try to like Iterate. build the world and then, you know, do it in one shot. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well great talk, Josh. Yeah, uh, excited for all of this. Seems to be a lot of great conferences. Shout out PHP Tech. Um, I don't think I'll be able to attend this year, but it's on my list for next year for sure. So uh, thanks to everybody in the PHP Tech community. Uh, that's a very sweet conference. Shout out Longhorn. Longhorn's a great conference. It sounds like there's a couple of other, I think like um, Northwest, PHP Northwest is doing something or talking about doing something. I can't remember, but a lot of exciting stuff starting to kick back up here. So definitely if you uh, want to check something out, uh, one of those conferences is a great way to meet people and a great way to learn and expand your skill set. So I, I, I'm just curious, Logan, anything kind of cool catch your eye over the last month as far as anything new in PHP? I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but uh, <laughs> just kind of eat up the last 10 minutes we have. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the the new releases are always, uh, you know, there's interesting stuff there. And, um, you know, I've been uh, kind of on my uh, learning a lot uh, Kubernetes the last couple of years. Um, so my current kind of goal is uh, like the K3 um, uh, project. So uh, trying to basically get, uh, it's, you know, like a mini Kubernetes running on a single node and where you can deploy. Because um, a, a lot of, you know, I, I kind of have a mix of, like uh you know kind of the old like ssh deployment approaches and then like some of the other stuff is my per personal and you know uh and you know old company stuff um and some of it's like docker you know just like one one server with a bunch of containers on it you know that i manually manage um so yeah i'd like to make the uh container stuff a little bit easier uh for small non you know, non uh, EKS or, or GKE kind of scale projects, you know, like something mm -hmm. you can self host yourself. Um, uh, so, yeah. 
Yeah, I remember I tried to learn GKE because I I had a I have like I don't know twenty WordPress websites stuck on a server, and I'm like I want to use GKE to like reduce costs and then like make it easier to deploy new sites. And this was probably three or four years ago, and boy, I hit so many roadblocks. Like, so I gave up, but. From my understanding, the tooling has got a lot more mature and things are a lot less mysterious in the Kubernetes world. So um, that'd be a great talk if somebody wants to give that one day, <laughs> like uh, Kubernetes and PHP or just Kubernetes in general. Sheesh. Yeah, I'll I'll um, I'll write an article first and then and then uh, work on a talk. <laughs> so yeah, uh, no. yeah. I'm not uh, volunteering you. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need people from the community to reach out. Yeah. Stefano. Yeah. yeah I know you got a good talk. We got a bunch of people here in the chat. So I love let's, to let's, learn new things. Yeah. Let's bring uh, let's bring some other organizers up here as we uh, wrap things up. Let's do it. Hey, Bobby, Mark, what's up? What's up, guys? Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hello. hello. Good. Thanks for the talk, Josh. Of course, of course. Ben. Chris, what's up? There we go. Thanks so much, Josh. Really informative. Yeah, cool. No, no of, of course. Um, maybe just to introduce everybody, does everybody want to go around and just mention which user groups you all are from? I'm, I'm from Austin. <laughs> Atlanta. I'm, I'm from here, Merch. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> You're everywhere. Ben's everywhere. Yeah, I was I was saying that uh, we should. Uh, Ben's like the speaker of the groups. You know, it's like the speaker of the house. You know, it was, you know. he he has veto power. Is what yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> Founding member. Mark, what? I think you're out of Arizona, right? Utah. Utah. Oh, okay. Apologize. I'm from Boston, PHP. Boston. My kid is a huge Boston fan, uh, baseball team. <laughs> so Sox. He wants to go out there so bad. So I got to hit nice. you up if we do. Yeah. I'll drag him to a PHP meetup. I'm sure he'll love that. <laughs> cool. I, I guess before we all hop off, is anything cool happening in the last month in, in the PHP space you guys have kind of seen? Nothing? Okay, well, when did 8.3 came out? Uh, 8.3 came out recently. No, didn't November. It? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. my recently, meaning I, I'm i just now upgrading to it, I guess. <laughs> what's, Wait, in, we, what's in 8.3? Anything cool? I think we, there's we, a did a, we did a talk on it. Uh, I think, was it Tim this year or Ian? I think it might have been Ian. Uh, oh, okay, I got to go back and watch uh, that one. Oh, Lena's here also. All right. I, I, uh, oh, yeah. Hey. I brought you up as well. Sweet. We just need two more and we'll look like the Brady Bunch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no. Uh, I can't say there There was, I guess, a recent uh, CVE that came out for Composer that I've been looking at. But other than that, I guess just like you can escalate privileges with like code execution, but... I don't think anything's serious, but I'll, I'll never forget uh, who here remembers when PHP like almost released a huge backdoor, but Sarah caught it. D does anybody know that story? Chris knows that story. Yeah. I, ju I just remember the topic. I don't remember this, the background. <laughs> Sorry. No, well, yeah. I, it's, uh, I guess that's the reason that they finally ditched their old uh version control and because they i don't think they ever actually figured out how that bad commit got injected into the code base but i, I don't think they're signing the commits or something was that it okay yeah yeah but i think they just like uh, that that one security thing they just decided to just let's just rip the band-aid and put it on github and call it a day versus having our own internal thing but, uh, Didn't they used to have it like mirrored on GitHub or something? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. But um, so far, 
uh, people give so much hate on PHP being insecure, but I, I, I don't, after the great people in the PHP community and them catching that, I feel like a lot of other communities, you see it in the JavaScript world, but that completely could have passed through and completely decimated a lot of companies. So shout out to Sarah and I'm sure there was other people involved in catching that, but. <laughs> I think it was like your typical like WordPress hack too, where it was like a bunch of base 64 encoded stuff that allowed remote execution or something. Well, um, did we have any more comments, final comments? What, uh, so next month, what was the talk again? Uh, what is that debug? Something R debug? What is it? Yeah, it's just for um, like it, it help you kind of debug your code, um, you know, like tracing and stuff. And it's open source. Um, I think it's pretty okay. recently uh, version 1.0 XR debug. Yeah. Um, if you've used uh, yeah. the uh, Spady has yeah. got the Ray product, um, uh, it's kind of similar to that. Um, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear about it. Hmm. Is it built on top of Xdebug, or is it a standalone thing? It, it's a standalone thing. Um, uh, the developer, uh, he, he's got his own library that he's been working on, um, and he's kind of, like, built some tooling on top of that library. Um, so... This is kind of his his the biggest thing to come out of his his library work. Interesting. Yeah, it looks cool. All right, I'm excited to hear that. Yeah, sure. All right, I guess let's wrap up. So again, mergephp.com. If you want to sign up for a talk, there there's a way to do that from the website, right? There's like a submit a talk button there. Yeah, there's a short link. Um, yep, it was in the slides at the beginning. Um, I I believe it's just uh, m hp.io uh, slash speakers. Yeah. If you go to mergephp.com and scroll to the bottom, there's speaker uh, sign up there. So uh, submit uh, there. I think most of the meetup event descriptions have it pasted at the bottom somewhere. Sweet. Yeah. Follow us on meetup.com. And uh, yeah, keep, keep uh, ride, ride the uh, pipelines. Yeah, feel free to DM me if anybody's got questions about that. And thank you to all of you for helping support Merge PHP. If you do run a user group and you'd like to join me, Merge PHP, feel free to reach out. We love new user groups and people involved in the organ organizing of, of these things. It's not easy. So got to show some love to all the user group organizers out there and uh, make this thing into a, a you know cool place to share cool new stuff. Yep. All right. Well, with that, with that note, uh, I think that was a good good outro. I'm gonna end it. Thank you all for joining us. See you next month. Cowabunga. Bye.